What's up everybody, welcome back to Polygon Academy. Tim here as always, and this is part two of the Trim Texture Creation Tutorial Series. So in the last video, we planned out our trim sheet, created our base mesh. If you missed that, there's a link to that video down in the description below. But this time, we're bringing it into ZBrush and starting to add a lot of detail and getting really creative. For me, this is really where the fun begins. Um, and there was a lot of questions in my trim sheet overview video about how I sculpt it and keep it tileable. So we're definitely gonna be going over that entire process today. So we're gonna start by breaking up the edges of our sculpt, giving it a nice organic feel to the rocky sections of the mesh uh, before moving on and using layers to non-destructively uh, add some finer detail to our mesh like cracks and you know, surface texture. That way, if we wanna remove it uh, or if we take it too far and there's too much damage on a mesh, uh, we don't have to start from scratch. And this is a really important part of my workflow that allows me to make quick variations on my sculpt as well. So before we get sculpting, don't be afraid to smash that like button, but let's hop over to the computer and dive right in. All right, so here we have ZBrush open, uh, nothing loaded yet, but what we're gonna do, the first thing we're gonna do is go and import those uh, trim base meshes that we exported in the last video. Uh, so we're gonna import, go to my trims, export, start with trim A, draw it out, hit T to go into edit mode. <laughs> Um, and so if you remember, this is those three blocks along the bottom of the trim sheet. What we're going to need to do is import all of the rest of our trims so they're all stacked together. And what we're going to do is import each of those as its own subtool. So if you go up here to the Z plugin and subtool master, you can actually uh, import all of those at once. So if I go to multi append and just go from trim B to trim G, bam, 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 it loads all of our trim sheets. Um, so if we go into our subtools here, you can see they're all, they even kept all the names and stuff like that. Uh, so this is, we're going to start working on trim A and it's the three big blocks. So it doesn't look like that right now because it's just the flat polygons and they're exactly airtight together. Uh, if we divide this, you're going to see it, it kind of destroys it. Um, so this is what I was talking about in the last video is we need to actually turn off smooth for the first couple times we divide this. So maybe one, two, three times and then turn on smooth again, hit divide. Uh, that actually looks, maybe I'll do one more time without the smooth. Uh, turn smooth on, hit divide. So that's looking a bit better and we're gonna divide this up to about 1.2 million polygons for this, uh, this trim here. And we're gonna do this for the rest of our trims just to get that initial look of how things are all gonna turn out uh, when we divide them. So I'm gonna go into the subtools. Just go, I'm gonna go through and divide all these up uh, and I'll do a little bit of a time lapse of that and stop if there's anything I need to mention. But it's literally the same process for each trim. Just turn off smooth, divide it three or four times, turn on smooth and divide it up to about roughly a million polygons um, for each trim, maybe a million, two million. Uh, that's, that's, that should be totally enough geometry to play with for each trim here and not kill our computer at the same time. And all right, we actually just ran into an issue here. You can see when I use that process on this mesh here of turning off smooth, uh, dividing it a bunch, and then turning smooth back on, you get this really faceted look on the curve. Uh, and that's something that we actually don't wanna have to deal with. Uh, we want this to be a nice smooth curve, but hard edges on the thing. So that was actually caused by not having enough initial geometry in our base mesh. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna hop back over into 3D Studio Max here. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to add the turbo smooth and crank that up a couple times, uh, maybe two iterations. Uh, just do a quick test by adding another turbo smooth to smooth it on top. And this is exactly how we want our ZBrush uh, mesh to look. See how there's no faceting going on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually just delete that smoothing turbo smooth, but keep this one that's adding more geometry to the mesh. And just, I'm gonna quickly re-export that. as an OBJ, and this is, you see here, trim D. So this is the importance of naming everything. So I'm just gonna re-export that, go back into ZBrush, go into my subtools, D, I'm gonna actually just, where is it? The option to delete. Uh, okay, that trim's gone. So we're just gonna re-import that uh, now that we've deleted it. Um, we're going to go to the Z plugin, multi append. We're just going to bring back in trim D. Boom, here we go. Uh, so, you, as you can see, you can already see there's a lot more geometry to it. 
Uh, so if I go into my subtools, select trim D, and this time when I divide it, I'm gonna keep smooth on, hit divide, and that's gonna give us a nice smooth curve result. Uh, so sometimes if you're dealing with curves, it's better for your base mesh to actually have more geometry from inside 3D Studio Max. So I go back to Max, you can see compared to all the other meshes, uh, the initial polygon density is a lot higher. That just means you're going to have to divide it uh, only a couple times inside of ZBrush instead of like five, ten times uh, because the initial starting geometry is a lot higher. Also, what we're going to do is we're going to switch this. I hate the red wax material. Uh, I find it really doesn't give you a good indication of what's going on in your mesh. Uh, the one that I usually use is the matte cap gray cavity. Where is it? Matte cap gray. Uh, sorry, matte cap white cavity. That, this is the one that I usually use. Um, I find this just gives you a better view of actually what's going on with your mesh. The red wax has a lot of like crazy highlights and different like surface properties going on in the material that really doesn't give you an accurate view of your sculpt. All right, so now that we've kind of subdivided all of our base trims, we can actually start to sculpt. Uh, you can actually already see how this trim sheet is going to look. Um, now that all the bricks, you can even see the beginnings of those. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start on the bottom ones here. So the first brush I'm going to use on this Actually, the first thing I'm going to do, sorry, before I start sculpting, is go to my polygroups. Because right now, uh, if I, if you hold Control Shift and click on this, uh, what I'm going to do is actually that will isolate the the objects. But right now, it's all one object, um, and I want to be able to sculpt on these bricks individually. So if I go down to polygroups and just hit Auto Groups, if I press Shift F, uh, you can see that they're all different colors now. If I undo that. Um, before it was all just gray if I press Shift F, but if, when I hit Auto Groups, it breaks all of the different uh, sub-elements down into their own meshes, and if I press Control Shift and click on it now, I can actually just work on this brick individually. Control Shift, click off in the empty space, uh, and that way I can work on individual pieces of my mesh. It's super handy um, just to be able to sculpt around corners of bricks and stuff like that. So I always go in, and for each one of these that have separate elements to them, I'll just hit Auto Groups on the poly groups, and that way I can you know, isolate sections that I want to work on. And I usually also uh, just hide all the other ones that I'm not working on, just so I can stay focused on trim sheet A. Uh, I'm going to turn off the coloring here. Um, so yeah, here we have our three basic bricks, and we're just going to start dinging up all these edges. The brush that I'm going to use is the one, same one I actually used in the wood sculpting tutorial. Uh, it's the trim, smorter, trim Border Smooth Brush. So if you click in your light box, go to Brushes, Trim, and then Trim Smooth Border down here. Uh, this is a great brush for doing like big chunky damage and stuff like that. Uh, I'm going to bring down the intensity a bit and just start going over the mesh. And I'm going to turn on perspective so it actually looks properly uh, while I'm working. Yeah, and the hotkey for that is P for perspective. Um, but yeah, just control shift, click on this and hide the rest of it. And I'm just going to go over these edges and start dinging them up. And I'm going to also, I'm going to use uh, square alpha. I find this gives you a lot sharper edges on, on especially stuff for like stone and brick that tends to crack and break and not just be smoothly worn off over time. Um, this is, uh, gives me the nicest results I find. Uh, and because each of these individual stones um, are their own object. I don't have to worry about it, uh, a straight line tiling across the texture because there's a hard seam line in this piece. But for the, uh, the trim above it where it's a continuous tiling piece of stone uh, wall, uh, we're definitely going to make that tileable when we sculpt it. Um, so I'm just going to go over and start digging up these objects. This is pretty much my workflow for sculpt sculpting rock or stone or anything like that. Just go in and start kind of digging things up, breaking it up. Uh, you don't want to be too uniform with your damage, but you also don't want to have crazily recognizable repeated detail. Uh, so if there's a huge slash across this brick, um, every time that tiles, you're going to see slash, 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 and it's going to be really apparent it's a tiling texture. So I'm just going to kind of give this a bit of uniform damage um, that just looks like it's been kind of aged and worn over time. And I'm just really going to be quick with this. I just basically want to give it some detail and sense of form. Uh, because a lot of the smart materials I'm going to use inside Substance Painter, they're going to add some nice highlights and stuff like that too. So I don't need to go too crazy. I just want to give um, the smart materials something to play off of from my initial sculpt.
So there we go. Uh, we basically just chipped off all these edges. It's going to have some nice chunky detail in the normal map. Uh, and like I said, if you hold shift and just rotate till your camera is directly facing head on with this, it's going to pretty much show you exactly how your normal map is going to look. Um, so you can already see if you've added enough detail to the bottoms and the sides of these. Uh, it looks like when the light rolls over this, it's going to look really cool. Uh, there's enough detail there. It's not a tiny super one pixel line of uh, information for the normal map on trim B. So this piece is, like I said, it's going to be a continuous horizontal tiling piece of stone uh, that's really good for wrapping around walls and pillars and stuff like that. Uh, but because it's, there isn't a hard definitive seam for each block, uh, we want we sculpt from one end, we want it to wrap around to the other end. Uh, so what I'm going to do is in my brush settings, and this is per brush. So if you switch brushes, you have to turn this on for every single brush. Uh, and I've definitely made that mistake before of sculpting, switching brushes, and then kept going, assuming it was tiling across to the other side and it didn't happen uh, and I had to go back and re-sculpt it. Um, but if you go into your brush, uh, there is, I believe, under curve, uh, you want to turn on wrap mode. So you turn this to one. And now if you see when I sculpt across the edge of this mesh, it continues along over here uh, and I can continue my stroke and it, it gets a bit messy. Really, you just want to hit, hit the edge and it'll start to you know, wrap across. Um, and then you would just go over to the other side and continue on. But then if I, act, if I go back a little bit, you know, it, it continues the stroke back over here. Um, so what I'm going to do is the exact same thing. I'm just going to go over and start adding, you know, some chunky detail to this here. Go over the edge a little bit. And you can see it's continuing all that damage along this side. Uh, and then I'm just going to keep on trucking. And of course, don't forget to save your work. <laughs> So there you go. We can already see that we've have two of our trims pretty much blocked out uh, in terms of the tiling detail. Uh, there's some nice, you know, difference in between the different surfaces um, in these grooves, uh, as well as keeping them tight together. So when we bake our normal map, there's no gaps that we have to deal with because uh, that would just add an extra bit of headache when you're trying to do the UVs. Um, so what I'm going to do through and do is sculpt the rest of these uh, shapes out and uh, we'll time lapse that out really quick. And next thing, we're going to be adding some cracks and ornate details to this mesh after that. All right, so there we go. We have our first pass on like the major forms of all of our bricks and stuff. The overall level of wear and tear is really consistent. Uh, nothing's jumping out too much as like uh, gonna be something that's going to be repeatedly tiled and really noticeable. So I should be able to use this across quite a large modular kit. So now that we've got our base sculpt done, uh, we're going to start adding some damage and cracks to this. Uh, and one thing I would recommend doing is actually using the layers function inside of ZBrush. That way, uh, if you start to add a bunch of cracks and damage, but it's a little too much, you can either scale it back or even just turn off that layer completely without having your base level of the mesh uh, completely destroyed and having to re-sculpt the entire thing. So if you go to layers, just add a new layer, I'm going to call it like uh, cracks. Uh, you can see here it says record, and that means that, like the layer is active and recording whatever you're doing by default. Um, sometimes you can be sculpting, like if I hit this button, it's, it stops recording. Uh, and if I start sculpting, it's going to actually put it into the base layer of my overall sculpt and I won't be able to, you know, dial it back. Um, so whenever you're adding stuff like this, just double check that the, uh, if you hit that little button there, that it says, uh, Rick, like REC, like uh, record. And, uh, I'm going to be using some damage brushes that I picked up over my years in the industry. Uh, it's a set called like plaster damage. I can't remember exactly where I got it. Um, but if you just go on Google and search for plaster damage ZBrush brushes, I think it might be free. I can't remember. I've just had them on my hard drive for years. Um, but uh, you should be able to find them or similar cracks brushes. There's like hundreds of sets out there. 
Uh, so what I'm going to do is just on this layer of called cracks, I'm going to go in and start adding some larger forms, uh, but nothing that's going to be too noticeably repeatable. Uh, I find a lot of these brushes, they work well on, say, like the corners of meshes. Just, you know, drag it out. And I'll actually probably even just use my mouse for this. Um, but it's good for adding, you know, like a little subtle detail to, to overall uh, corners and edges and stuff like that um, of just some, you know, cracks in your mesh. I find a good trick is to really zoom out and see if there's anything that jumps out as like a massive, huge crack across one surface that uh, is going to really be tileable. Um, but in this case, I just want to evenly kind of distribute the damage across the mesh. So I think that's good. Uh, if we zoom out, there's uh, like a bit of interesting detail there, but nothing too, uh, too crazily repeatable. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the record button to save that into the layer. And the nice thing about it is you can see if I, with this slider, I can actually turn that, uh, that dial back that detail uh, if, if it was too extreme um, or too heavy. And then with the, I can actually even just toggle it on and off. So you see it's, it's really a non-destructive workflow that's super, super awesome. Uh, so I'm gonna go through and add some uh, surface. What I'm gonna do is add some uh, surface detail, like surface noise to this, this mesh. And then I'm gonna go and do a pass on the entire, uh, entire trim sheet of the whole same thing. So I'm gonna create another layer Rename it uh, Stone Surface. And uh, this is going to be more like fine granular detail. Uh, in that same brush set, there is, I think, one Concrete Detail 01. Yeah, this is the one I usually use. Uh, obviously not that big um, and not that intense, but I'll crank down the, in the intensity. And usually what I'll do uh, is I'll just qu quickly cover the entire mesh in it just to get some like nice breakup on that surface of make it look like stone. Really not, you know, fine detailing this too much. And then usually another trick I usually do is uh, I go back to my uh, trim border smooth brush. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll just use it to knock back some of that detail and smooth out some areas. Uh, just by like scribbling over the mesh, you can like flatten out some stuff just to kind of break up the surface. Because we don't want this mesh to be covered in complete noise um, because I'm thinking ahead to where the substance designer smart materials that I'm going to use, they actually add a really fine noise on the top of the, the sculpt already. So I just want some a little bit of break up to this. Uh, I don't want it to be completely flat, but then I just want it to feel like some like smoothed out stone that people have been walking over for, you know, hundreds of years or whatever. So just knock back some of that noise. Um, just have some flatter sections on the mesh. And I find that looks pretty good when it's baked out. So I'm going to go and repeat this entire process again over all of these different trims. Um, just remember to turn on wrap mode for each individual brush, uh, like this crack here, as well as to use layers. Um, for each individual subtool, you have to create layers. Uh, it, it's easy to forget, and then you know, you've been working for 20, 30 minutes, and you realize you've done it all on your base mesh. Not the end of the world, but uh, just kind of like once you build up those habits of checking that you're using layers and using wrap mode, uh, it, you should solve yourself a lot of problems down the road. Um, so you can see brush, wrap mode is turned on for this massive crack. So even if I sculpt here ac across the edge of this mesh, it tiles across nicely and we can add some big cracks and stuff like that across this. And it's on a layer, which means we can easily remove it or change it later on. Um, and I'm just gonna go across and start detailing this out. So for this next part, uh, there was a ton of questions about how exactly I did that tiling pattern of using one of Jonas Rodegaard's uh, ornate trim brushes. And for this, I basically, I go to, um, I load up the brush. This is one of his, uh, we're gonna have some nice curly detail here. Uh, and we're gonna go to the stroke and turn on uh, Lazy Mouse. And then I'm also going to turn on backtrack and snap to track, as well as choosing the line option. Um, that way, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click and drag out this path, keeping the line as straight as possible, ideally down the center of the mesh. 
And then when I start to draw backwards again, it stays on that plane, even if I move my mouse up and down. And should wrap around a bit. Now you're going to notice that uh, on the edges, it's probably not going to tile perfectly. Um, and this can cause you a million you know, hours of headaches trying to get the perfect stroke, the perfect distance, all that stuff. Uh, for me, I found it was just way faster to fix that in Photoshop, to be honest, um, after we bake. Uh, it'll take like five minutes. And instead of sitting here for hours trying to get this, this looking exactly uh, perfect on our sculpt, uh, we want, if it's 99% correct, um, we have to fix one little percent after we bake, it's a lot faster than trying to get it uh, perfect every time. So I'm just gonna redo that, click, drag out a line down the center of the trim where I want it, right to the end there, and then drag back. And that looks pretty good, I think. Um, like I said, we'll just clean this up in Photoshop afterwards. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people send me messages saying, oh, I can't get it to tile perfectly inside of ZBrush, even with wrap mode. And uh, it's a bit of a pain in the ass. If, if anyone knows how to do that perfectly, definitely drop a comment down below. Uh, I would be more than happy. <laughs> It'll save me uh, some headache um, and having to go into Photoshop and fix it. All right, so here's a quick and dirty sculpt. Uh, obviously, I didn't spend a lot of time on this. Um, if I was doing this as a professional texture, I'd probably spend more than like, a, you know, an hour, hour and a half sculpting all this. But like even just with the quick and dirty pass of doing some cracks and using some alphas and stuff like that, we can add a lot of detail very quickly. Uh, it's going to bake down to a really nice normal map. Um, the main thing, like I said, is avoid, avoid repetitive details. So even though I use the same two crack brushes and the same uh, surface noise texture across the entire mesh, if you look at it, nothing really stands out as like, oh, the same crack repeated and repeated. It's just like some small level cracks across surfaces with some surface noise that makes it feel kind of rough. Um, and this will give us a really good starting point once we bake this down inside of Substance Painter. Um, and as for that little uh, trim thing here, it's just kind of magically worn away and aged there that uh, in between the seams. Um, so I think probably even when we bake this, uh, there won't be really an issue. So to export this, uh, I just again go to Z plugin, Subtools Master, and we're going to go to export uh, OBJ, good. And I'm just going to put this into a folder just called like sculpted. Uh, just because if I put it in my export folder, uh, I'm going to get confused when I'm, you know, my base mesh and my sculpted for final version. So uh, we're just going to hit that. Export that out. And what this is doing, uh, because I use Subtool Master, it's actually exporting every single one of my subtools uh, instead of having to manually go through and export each one by hand. Uh, so this, you just have to wait and sit, and it'll go through it. And then we'll have all of our high polys ready to bring back into Max to set up for the bake uh, in Substance Painter in the next video. All right, so we're pretty much at the halfway point, guys. Uh, we've got our mesh sculpted up, some cool detail added, uh, and we're ready to get this baked down to a texture and a really nice normal map. And that's exactly what we'll be doing in part three of this series. Next, we're gonna be taking this into Substance Painter. I'm gonna show you exactly how I bake it down to a flat plane, check that it's still tileable, and use some smart materials to really quickly uh, and effectively create some nice surfaces on our material. If you're not already subscribed to the channel and you want more tutorials and content like this showing up in your feed, you know what to do. If you think I left something out or you have questions about the ZBrush workflow that I showed in this video, drop them down below and I'll do my best to get back to you. As always, thank you for watching. See you in the next video.